welcome everyone for our first panel uh, session on the first evening of the Real Truth About Health seminar. Uh, it's also a pleasure and a privilege to be with uh, new, newly discovered colleagues here and to recognize that we're a growing body of humans worldwide that are willing to make the changes necessary so hopefully we can take a suffering humanity and bring them back to normality. Uh, we just had a consensus. I knew that we all would get along because when four people can come and have a consensus in two minutes of how this is going to run, I'm going to let you know. And then we're going to start here to Deborah on my right. Uh, we're going to speak on our subjects for seven minutes, and then we're going to speak to one another for three minutes. And after you have to listen to all of we experts, we're going to open up for questions and answers and anyone who will have a question, we cannot take it unless you're at the microphones. Uh, we can't acknowledge you unless you're at the microphones so that your fellow uh, attendees in all the states and all the countries in the world can listen to us and hear. So here we go to my right, seven minutes of discussion, and then we get to ask Deborah and every other person uh, because we're getting to know one another right here now. Thank you, and, and, and good evening. Um, uh, it's really um, delightful to get a chance to meet people who I've admired in, from their writing for, for years. And what I want to talk about is sort of the big picture of the context of how we got into this situation with respect to electromagnetic fields and microwave radiation. Uh, we have a tradition in the United States of um, looking at the new technology as though it has to be safe until it's proven to be guilty. And our assumption, the default assumption which, which we greet anything new is it's got to be a good idea. Otherwise, why would we be doing it? And that policy has clearly shown us uh, that it's not been correct. For example, if you look at things like asbestos, asbestos was used by Charlemagne uh, with a tablecloth that was made of asbestos, and he would throw it into the fire to clean the crumbs because it would not burn, and he could get rid of all of the garbage on the tablecloth. Uh, years later, uh, when people started living a little bit longer, it was noted that those who worked to mine asbestos, which could be knit into a cloth, um, tended not to live very long. And by the 17th, 18th century, Ramazzini had uh, figured out that people who did mining of minerals, whether asbestos or iron or, in fact, the early version of coal or lignite, tended to have lung disease, and it was noted that these were problems. But still the technologies, whether it was asbestos cloth or fiber or coal mining or the production of iron, the technologies were assumed to, to be safe uh, until proven to be guilty. And I think we have to, as a society, rethink our approach to technologies in general. And I think we have the right to ask for some evidence of safety as well as efficacy before we start with something new. And I think of things like Google Glass. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen Google Glass. Google Glass, has anyone seen it? Anyone tried to use it? Right. Um, it's quite ingenious, but it involves taking a microwave radiating device, keeping it right near the temporal lobe, having it constantly sending a signal back and forth to the front of the glass where it projects an image to a third device. And so it's constantly radiating that microwave radiation that you heard me talk about earlier today. And when I asked, which I did, one of the senior people in the Google program, what were you thinking when you put a microwave radiating device right smack next to the brain and in front of the eye that has no cooling mechanism? They said, what were we thinking? We weren't. Honest. Honest. I said, okay, well, now I'd like you to think about it. Well, obviously, at this year's Consumer Electronics Show, the hottest new item being touted by everybody is wearable electronics. And not only wearable, but implantable. You can monitor your blood pressure, your pulse, and your, other, and your lung function by swallowing a chip or wearing or implanting a computer into your body. People are already using this to keep track of their companion animals. 
Some people have apparently done it for children or people with Alzheimer's who might be wandering. There are trade-offs in life, but I think we need to rethink our approach to technology, whether it's nanotechnology or GMOs or some of the toxic chemicals that we're dealing with, rather than assuming that if we can do it technologically, if we can put the gene of a tomato into a fish, it's a good idea. I'm not so, I think that that assumption is what we have to challenge. I, I really think we do. And in my work in the history of uh, cancer research and the secret history of the war on cancer, I repeatedly document how that assumption proved false. Let me give you one example. During World War II, and prior to the run-up to World War II, British chemists synthesized something called diethylstilbestrol. It was made by the British government. They didn't patent it. So the Germans immediately began to produce it, of course. That was what went on economically during that time prior to the war. It was discovered upon its invention. It was identified as a possible cancer-causing agent, diethylstilbestrol, a hormone. The Germans manufactured it and used it to fatten their cows and pigs. It wasn't until it was proven to cause cancer in women 40 years later that we stopped using it as such. That kind of thinking, I think, has to stop. Pass the microphone. Sure. And now I know I have a... a Do we ask questions now? Oh, are we asking yes. questions yeah, or talking now? We can ask questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, do you have a question? Sure. Go ahead. Um, I have a question, Deborah. What was the most shocking moment, or one of them, that you had discovered in your research about the thinking that poisons us? I discovered the um, self-published biography of a guy named Robert Crane, C-R-A-N-E, who had been an electrical engineer for Motorola and who'd served as a guinea pig testing the early, early phones. Remember, the phones were first invented actually in the 70s, and the only thing preventing them from proliferating was that we had rules at localities preventing towers from going everywhere. And they knocked that out in 1996 by passing a National Telecommunications Act that specifically forbids you from raising a health issue about the concern location of any tower. It's against the federal law. That was passed under my president, Bill Clinton. I had no idea what was going on. We now know that once you pass that law, it made it possible to put towers anywhere, including a few feet outside your bedroom, which happens in some cities. And what Robert Crane wrote in his biography was a sickening uh, account of the callous thinking of the industry. He himself developed two brain tumors. He wrote the book in between recovering from one or the other. And I interviewed people who knew him and people who were told to stay away from him when they worked for industry who he felt ashamed because this industry did such a good job. Whenever someone would report an issue, as he did, here he was exposed. He, would, he had to hold these things. He would get headaches and heated up his, he would get heat effects because he was using that much. And yet when he complained of this, they just blew him off and, uh, and he died, obviously, of, the, of these brain cancers. And that, that was pretty horrifying. You know, I think one other example was this fellow, quite a character I write about in a chapter called The Doctor Who Danced with the Devil. He worked for the tobacco industry for years until 1992. He was the director of tobacco industry research for Germany, had lots of money. And in 1992, he published his research showing that tobacco caused cancer. I know that may shock you. But he actually believed, as a German scientist, that uh, he wasn't sure until that moment. Well, in 1992, he's one of the most powerful people in German science. The tobacco industry was much more respected in Germany than it was the United States. Although, remember, in the United States, they did pretty well for a long time with Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. They did. And when he left that job, they gave him something to do kind of keep him busy, and they gave him a project to work on cell phones with $5 million grant from the European Union, and he, like I at the time, was convinced there could be no problem. So when they started to get positive results showing that cell phones could damage the brain, they went out and bought a couple million dollars in new equipment because he was convinced it was a measurement error, right? It couldn't be possible that cell phones could damage brain cells. After all, they got new equipment, spent a couple 
million dollars more, but the result couldn't go away. And then when he tried to publish it, they went after him, just like he had seen others go after, you know. And this guy, fortunately, was rather wealthy and powerful, and he went after them. And just recently, he filed a lawsuit against them, and they tried to get him accused of fraud, which you know is a pretty serious thing for a scientist. They tried to get his articles withdrawn from publication, and when that failed, they hired a public relations group to, quote, war game the science. And I have that memo in my book, war game the science. And when all of that failed, he, he ultimately prevailed, but even today, Science Magazine has never issued a retraction of their story accusing him of fraud. Hmm. Yeah. Time for another question? Yeah. I guess one of the questions I would love to know is, is there anything we can, what can be done now that this technology is completely pervasive and the utility of it is everybody has been convinced we need to have this technology, is there anything that now can be done either to make it safe or change the landscape of how it's being used and how we're exposed to this? Yes. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to working with you all on this. And we have a limited number of these cards here that tell you how to practice safe tech. And they say do it with <laughs> wires or do it wired. Practice safe tech. Use and carry wireless gear away from your head and body. Beware of weak network signals, because when the signal's weak, the device has to work harder, whether it's a laptop or an iPad or your phone. Before bedtime, turn off your wireless devices and networks. Most of them constantly emit radiation. Get in the habit of powering off more often, because each device radiates anybody around you. The worst time to have your phone on is when you're in a car driving and holding it next to your head, or if you're in an elevator or a train that is not wired for an antenna, then the radiation pings all over the place. You're like in a microwave oven. Uh, generally go corded versus wireless. That means landlines are important for three reasons. They're safer, they're more secure, and they're better for your long-term health. And in storms, like we've just had, these wireless devices don't work. How many of you lost power, couldn't get your cell phone to work during the cold? Right? It's, they're not meant for the cold. And the truth is, it, we are about to commit to a national policy that is insane to get rid of all corded landlines. You better let the president and the FCC know loud and clear that's a lousy idea. It's going to make American business vulnerable. It's going to mean that we will be able to sabotage the system very easily. Finally, say no to tech while moving. That means drocking, driving, walking, biking, blading, or skiing. And uh, where I am in Wyoming, people will be taking a cell phone and putting it inside their helmet when they're skiing or biking. Uh, or It's a terrible, t terrible idea. Distraction while you're moving can be the difference between life and death. Really, seconds, particularly when you're moving at high speeds or, you know, frankly, even on a bicycle. So these cards, you see these cards? They're really cute. They were designed by some artists in Wyoming, and they say, do it with wires, practice safe tech. <laughs> it's cute. It is, it is cute. Yeah. They will be available on our website and hopefully working with you as well. But to, it costs us close to a dollar a card. Now, we need companies to step forward that want to produce these cards, you can put your logo on it, or people who fund us uh, to give them away. We have another project, we're going to develop cards like this to hand to young harried parents who don't understand that a cell phone is on a pacifier. And we also have advice just on the phones alone. So we're working to come up with this sort of simple practical things you can do because we're not going to say no to these things any more than we'd say no to cars but we have to make them as safe as possible. And I do believe that people who are sensitive to wireless radiation have a right to be able to exist in public without feeling that their health is endangered. And that means we're gonna to have to create wireless free zones. Good.
Move on to Ms. Grossman now. Great job. Okay. Um, well, I, again, thank you all for being here. Um, this is really, really interesting just to absorb all of these new bits of, sort of overlapping information. And I think I will kind of pick up on something that Devra was talking about, which is, which I didn't talk about this morning very much, which is this idea that we assume things are safe until proven otherwise, new technologies, new materials, you know, these amazing things people have been making in the laboratory that are going to be stretchy waterproof surfaces, they're going to repel stains, they're going to do all these amazing things. And one of the really, really impressive things I learned while I was working on chasing molecules was in the green chemistry realm, and I learned this from John Warner, who's considered one of the founders of green chemistry, is that to this day, and it's slowly starting to change, but almost anywhere in this country, if you are getting a college degree, undergraduate degree, a master's degree, or a PhD in chemistry, and you are going to go on to have a career as a synthetic chemist, somebody making new chemicals that are going to go into making products and new materials and technologies, you do not ever have to take a course in toxicology or any kind of environmental health science so that you would have any training or any awareness that your material might have an effect on human health and the environment. And not very long ago, I was working on a story about the efforts that are being made in the aerospace and defense industries to move away from a really toxic um, toxic products that are made with hexavalent chromium, which is a very well-known carcinogen. But it turns out it's a really useful anti-corrosion material that goes into all sorts of um, coating materials that go on aircraft and military vessels, things that have to be in really extreme varied environments, whether it's the Arctic or the tropics, all of the above, are exposed to ocean salts. And so they've been relying on this really toxic chemical in these metal combinations. And I was talking to one scientist, and happily for him, I've forgotten exactly what his name is actually now. I just remembered it. I won't tell you right now. But they were working with these novel materials based on rare earths, which I'm sure some of you have been hearing about. And it was looking pretty promising that they were starting to commercialize some of these and these paints and coatings as alternatives to the hexavalent chromium. And so I asked him if they were looking into the environmental health effects of these new materials they were making so that they would not repeat a scenario of finding out that they had something that was really, really useful that but that turned out to be horribly toxic. And he said, no, we don't do that. Somebody else does that. The, the medical guys do that. The toxicologists do that. And I just, I mean, I'm, I can't really, I'm not being an advocate. I'm being a journalist, so I can't say, oh, my God, on the telephone. But I just thought, oh, my gosh, you know, every time I think we've made some leap forward, there are these great divides. So one of the things that I'm kind of interested in here is the fact that you have people who are either studying or working in or advocating in very traditionally might be very sort of separate disciplines or this talk this morning where somebody mentioned, oh, we don't do nutrition in medical school. Um, the fact that these things are considered separate really have to come together if we're going to solve these problems. And I'm working on a story now where I had editors say to me, we don't want you to talk about occupational health. We want you to talk about environmental health. And again, I'm sort of going, Oh my gosh, you can't, this is an environment, this is the workplace environment, this is the community environment for the people in this industry. So I think this idea that we've been keeping these disciplines separate is part of what Deborah was talking about, about assuming things are safe because you haven't kind of looked around the corner to ask a question about the other effects of your your new creation. And in chemistry, in synthetic chemistry, the goal was always to make something that performed in a certain way. And that performance was sort of the top priority. And then after that, could you make it quickly and efficiently and cheaply? Could you keep the cost down? 
no one ever looked at the health effects. That was always something that was done afterwards, and that is still happening today. And that's one of the big changes that green chemistry advocates are trying to make, is to start at the very beginning designing something that is safe. And the fact is that there's a huge amount of research going on now to enable scientists to very quickly compare chemical structures so we don't repeat the mistakes that have been made for years and years designing new chemicals that, guess what, those brominated flame retardants look just like the PCBs, and if you take a look at that molecule and look at something like an estrogen hormone, oh my gosh, they have very similar structures too. So what is, I mean, I'm not a chemist, but I can look at these pictures and I can see, oh my gosh, these things all look very similar. So it shouldn't be any surprise that they are going to be able to interact and interfere with each other and perhaps behave in similar ways. So the idea of putting these disciplines together so that people can ask really informed questions, whether it's about GMOs, a new technology, electronics technology, and not assume that somebody else will answer that question. And then, because you can't go backwards and sort of take these things out of the equation. Now we have, it would be much better to fix it from the outset. So. I may be yielding a minute of my time to the gentleman from Iowa, but I think that's kind of what I want to stop with now. When I was doing research a number of years ago for my book, Killer Fish, I was stunned uh, when they looked at the 250 most pristine waters in the world, uh, notably in the North and South Pole, people not living uh, any marginal amounts of people living there. And every bit of the water had pharmaceutical drugs in it. Uh, could you explain? You know probably more than I do. I, you know, I did this much research on it. Um, I'm much more familiar with the northern hemisphere than I am with the southern hemisphere. And one of the things I learned while working on my book, Chasing Molecules, and I did make several trips to the Arctic, um, for it so that I could hang out with scientists who were studying exactly what you just mentioned. And the fact is that anything that goes into the air in the northern hemisphere eventually moves north so that the Arctic has become a sink for persistent chemicals. And the people who live in the Arctic, very sadly, and actually I'm going to be working on a story about this shortly, um, are carrying sort of these awful kind of triple burdens because native communities in the far north, as many of us, many of you probably know, probably rely more on hunting and fishing for their primary food than anyone else in the world. Those marine mammals, Arctic fish, really high fat content. That's what's made them such a good, useful food source. But as you heard a lot this morning, the fat tissue is where these persistent toxic chemicals accumulate. And so the people who eat them are taking them in. They're accumulating in their bodies. And then there's the global drift that they're dealing with that's not coming from the direct food source. So it's, it's, a, it's a really serious problem. Well, that's that's interesting to me. You actually were with these scientists. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I was for a while one of them working on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And one of the things we, we noted was this global distillation effect that you just referred to. Uh, fat has been called a natural hazardous waste site. As you've written, it, it accumulates up the food chain. So at the top of the Arctic food chain is the polar bear and the whale. And they have some of the highest residues of lipophilic organochlorines ever found in the world. At the top of the human food chain is the nursing infant. Yeah. And as you've written as well, babies who have the higher levels of certain fat-loving chlorinated compounds tend to have more problems with their reproductive organs. Baby boys have smaller penises with defects and things like that. We were talking before about the fact that cell phone radiation appears to affect divalent calcium cations and that this is such a critical thing for membrane transport throughout any living system. What do you and I have to do to get the environmental movement to step up to the plate 
and understand that it is absolute nonsense to talk about toxic chemical reform, like everybody's talking about now, tweaking around the Lautenberg proposal, for example, and not address the fact that we live in a sea of radiofrequency radiation that has never existed in human history, and medical experts are now using that same radiation to open membranes with electroporation to deliver drugs, including chemotherapy, into the body, or in the case of ultrasound, to enhance the uptake with electrophoresis of therapeutic drugs for sore muscles, and yet deny that there's an interaction here between toxic chemicals and microwave radiation. Um, I am not a policy person. I am not with an NGO or an advocacy organization, but as you were talking, I was picturing some kind of informative hearing for um, ideally the Senate, mm -hmm. um, perhaps that Senate Environment and Public Works Committee where there are some people who are pretty smart and interested in these things, and get scientists who are working on that kind of brain chemistry, which there are, mm -hmm. um, and some of the experts in the field that you've been directly researching in the radiation, which I don't know very much about, and have them ex explain that these interactions are exacerbating the chemical environmental health exposures that everybody is spending so much time talking about it, and the thing that appears so persuasive, as you well know, to the most number of people is, is this having an effect on children's health? <laughs> um, is the fact that so many children, and I, I travel far more than I should, and I'm constantly absolutely horrified watching all these small children who have been given, you know, iPad-type tablets just to play with all the time. Um, is this having an effect on children's health? Is there something that you can bring to the fore? Because for, you know, for lots of reasons, if you can include children's health in the conversation, mm -hmm. suddenly it's not a political issue. You so don't so. have an industry yeah. as often trying to slice and dice. I, d I don't know. That would be my... Hmm. Uh, that actually yes. makes me think of something that I realize is not a proof of causation, but it is a fact that South Korea, which is one of the earliest adopters in the highest saturation rates of wireless devices, not only has an official diagnosis by neuropsychiatrists there of digital dementia, but also has a rate of autism that is Repeat that word. digital dementia, is a diagnostic category by neuropsychiatrists in South Korea that refers to the fact that the right brain is underdeveloped and confirmed as such in children, young children, who have be, been using digital devices from young ages. And that means, among other things, they lack empathy, they lack the ability to look you in the eye, to integrate thinking, to anticipate the consequences of their action, and control their impulses. So it's potentially huge. In addition, that country has a reported rate of autism that is three times higher than ours. And that's high. And the other thing that I'm curious about, which I've been hearing about anecdotally from friends and family who teach in elementary schools, is that the current generation of children who spend so much time on screens, and touch, particularly touch screens, are lacking in basic fine motor skills, oh, yeah. bad no, with absolutely. scissors. My sister teaches art. Yes. They're bad they with scissors, draw. can't draw, can't right. do pinching motions. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this is oh, both physical and physiological. There's, there's, there. Right. There's absolutely a neurodevelopmental um, axis here that develops. Children need to look you in the eye. They need to learn how to take those fat, stubby fingers and take a crayon and control its motion. And if they don't learn how to write and draw at a young age, we have an epidemic of, particularly of males, who cannot write. They cannot write their letters, some of them seven, eight, nine years of age, because they become keyboarders. Remember when it was called typing? That's when women did it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay? Keyboarding, okay? And these little kids grow up keyboarding, and their parents are so proud. You look on YouTube, you can see, search iPad five-month-old, and you'll see several YouTube videos of parents laughing as their babies are screaming when they withdraw the iPad that the babies are playing with. 
and they think it's funny? Welcome to the poison panel. <laughs> Who here came to be depressed? So make sure someone either on the panel or from the audience afterwards asks me the good news about GMOs because there's plenty. But I'm not going to use my seven minutes for the good news. First, I have to describe how bad this stuff is. How many people here have, are conscientiously avoiding genetically engineered foods in your life? Wow, okay, so this is the choir. Now, raise your hand if you notice that when you switched to a non-GMO diet or largely non-GMO, your health improved in some way. Raise your hand. Okay, we don't have time to interact right now, but I'm going to tell you what I have discovered in about 80 such talks. If I asked you to describe what are the symptoms that you noticed were eliminated completely or improved, we would definitely hear that the, the biggest most popular symptom probably in every single group is gastrointestinal. Also, allergies, asthma, skin conditions, brain fog, fatigue. Less common, infertility. More common, weight problems, headaches. It's across the board. When you look at the animal feeding studies, done on these genetically modified foods where genes are transferred between bacteria and viruses and forced into the DNA of soy, corn, cotton, canola, sugar beets, alfalfa, papaya, zucchini, and yellow squash. When you look at the animal feeding studies, as the American Academy of Environmental Medicine did, they said the animals are suffering from gastrointestinal, immune, reproductive, problems, organ damage, accelerated aging, dysfunctional regulation of cholesterol and insulin. Diabetes is another one of the symptoms that people report to find improvements and sometimes elimination when they eliminate GMOs. So we have a similarity between the lab animals and the humans. What the, what's afflicting the lab animals and what the humans and their doctors are saying are getting better when GMOs are removed. Now when humans get rid of GMOs, as you know, they're not yet labeled in the United States. So people have to create a strategy. And the main strategy is to buy organic, also reduced processed foods. Now, if you do those two things, you're immediately invoking cofactors that confound people like me trying to point out what's causing you to get better. Because organic has higher... A nutrient content, and it has reduction of other nasty chemicals. If you reduce processed foods, there's hundreds of things that you're avoiding. So it's hard to be clear as to what the cause is. But when livestock are taken from GM soy or corn and put on non-GM soy or corn, there are no cofactors. It is a simple, single change. So when I was in Chicago at a doctor's office who had prescribed non-GMO diets to 5,000 patients and told me everyone gets better and said within get, with um, mental issues, it's immediate. With uh, allergies and asthma, three to seven days. With gastrointestinal, up to four weeks, and it can be better over two years depending on the damage. She knew systematically how quickly people got better. I interviewed some of her patients. One of her patients was on a non-GMO diet for 25 days. She said three days into the diet, her Crohn's disease disappeared. She had already lost 10 pounds. Her brain fog was going away and her skin condition was clearing up. <clears throat> Someone else's irritable bowel was gone in three weeks. Another person in six weeks. When the Danish pig farmer took his pigs off of GM soy and substituted non-GM soy, the massive fatal diarrhea that he'd been dealing with for years disappeared in two days. People talk about getting better and having greater immune systems. When the pig farmer in Iowa took his pigs off of GM corn, the use of antibiotics and other medicines dropped by three quarters. So we see similar patterns in the livestock, humans and lab animals, and we're also hearing about it from pets and veterinarians. Same issues. These same problems are on the rise in the U.S. population since GMOs were introduced. You can look at the graphs on our website at responsibletechnology.org. You can see the 
irritable bowel, the inflammatory bowel, the peritonitis, the chronic constipation, the autism, the diabetes, the deaths from senile dementia, the deaths from Parkinson's, certain types of cancers. And the other thing is this. When you look at GMOs, there are two primary toxins. Most GMOs are sprayed with Roundup herbicide. Roundup is toxic. Others create their own toxin from within every cell called Bt toxin, which breaks open the stomach of insects. In tomorrow's talk, I'll be describing the characteristics of these toxins and why they predispose us to these same diseases and disorders. I'll give you one little brief teaser. The Bt toxin kills insects by poking holes in the cell walls of their guts. It is also a known allergen. Now, it's in corn. It turns out that the Bt toxin which does this was supposed to be benign and not affect humans or mammals. In 2012, a study showed that it pokes holes in human cells, just like in insects. In the insects, it allows things to go out of the stomach and into the other parts of the insect. In humans, that's called leaky gut. Leaky gut is linked to allergies, inflammation, autoimmune disease, cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, and numerous other problems. 93% of the women tested in Canada, the pregnant women, had Bt toxin in their blood. 80% of their unborn fetuses had Bt toxin in their blood. A study showed that Bt toxin is toxic to blood cells, red blood cells in mice. In the infant, in the fetus, there's no blood-brain barrier developed, so we may have hole-poking toxins in the brains of our offspring for this generation. Now, the Bt toxin should be wiped out pretty quickly in the blood, but why would 93% of Canadians who don't eat tortillas every day have Bt toxin in their blood? Well, the short answer, since I just got buzzed... <laughs> follow, follow through. All right. Yeah, follow through. A study in 2004 on soybeans, which are Roundup ready, they're not Bt toxin producing, found that part of the gene from the soybeans transferred to the DNA of gut bacteria inside our gut, and that that gut bacteria was unkillable with Roundup, suggesting but not proving that the, BT, that the gene had transferred into the DNA and continued to function. Now, if this happens after eating a corn chip and the BT gene transfers to your gut bacteria, it might convert it to living pesticide factories. Producing this allergen and hole-poking toxin inside of us 24-7, and that may be why 93% of the pregnant women in Canada had the Bt toxin in their blood, because they are producing it inside themselves. Now, in this competition for who can be scarier, how did I do? <laughs> <laughs> good job. All right, job. so someone has to ask me the good news, either now or later. Okay, who has a, a question? I'm sure we all have many. Um, as you know, there recently was a controversy in the British publication a nature that rescinded uh, the um, publication of an article uh, showing damaging effects of uh, GMO. Could you comment on and explain that to the audience and what is your view on that? Okay, excellent question. A French scientist named Doc, Professor G.E. Serralini was evaluating the uh, submissions by the biotech industry for the French government and for the EU. And he noticed that there were very serious problems, but these were confidential submissions. And he wanted to just comment in public that he was concerned, but was told that's illegal. He had to file a lawsuit just to be able to speak about his concerns and file a lawsuit, to, uh, Greenpeace filed a lawsuit to get access to some of these confidential submissions. And once they became public, he then was able to an analyze them and found that Monsanto's three types of corn were showing signs of toxicity, especially in the liver and kidneys, in 90 days. So he secretly, without telling Monsanto, because it's very hard to get research done when they know it's happening, extended the protocols of one of these corn studies. They just took exactly the same type of rats that Monsanto used, the exact same number of controls, and just extended it from 90 days to 24 months, the approximate lifespan of a rat. 
And they also added more things to look for and more experimental groups. In 90 days, the rats looked fine from the outside. The next month, they started getting tumors. By the end, up to 80% of the female rats had tumors. Up to 50% of the male rats had tumors. The experimental group died at two or three times the rate, and they had organ damage, liver, kidneys, and pituitary, compared to the controls. The other side, the biotech industry, freaked out because this was better research than had ever been done by the biotech industry, but they said, no, 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 it's unscientific, you used the wrong rats. The same rats that Monsanto used and published it in the same study. They said, oh no, the control group is too small. Same control group size. But they had a coordinated echo chamber of representatives of scientific administration and regulatory bodies and organizations around the world, reading from the same choir sheet, giving the same talking points, so that it muffled and suppressed the coverage. Then a report, a scientist from Monsanto, who had worked for Monsanto and did research for Monsanto after leaving the company, became the associate editor for biotechnology in this journal of food and chemical toxicology. And immediately, another study that was in implicating GMOs were dangerous to the blood cells, which I told you about, that was immediately disappeared from the, from the journal and was published somewhere else. Then a year and a half after this study was published, in September 19th, the one we're talking about from Seralini, last month it was retracted. The editor wrote a letter saying the retraction is not because there's any error, not because there's any fraud, but because the conclusion, because the evidence was not conclusive enough. Now, there is a very clear published standard for why a journal can retract, and this is not, does not qualify. There are hundreds, thousands of studies that don't have the conclusive levels that, that they were asking for. In fact, even at the same journal. So um, this is an example of how they control the, the science. Just the last thing, they found that the rats that got sick were those that were eating the Roundup Ready corn that had been sprayed with Roundup, plus the rats that had been eating the Roundup Ready corn with no Roundup, plus the rats that were eating just the Roundup with no corn in the drinking water at levels far less than we're exposed to. I'd just like to add a little cautionary note. This morning I urged people to go out and read scientific studies, and I'm still urging that because I think it's really important. But this reminds me that one of the things that's really important to do, especially when you see a study that stands out on its own, you know, and it's worth checking no matter what the conclusion is, you'll see something everybody has said, this thing is toxic, but here's a study that's saying it's safe or vice versa. Take a look in the acknowledgments and see who has funded the study. It is not always, you know, it doesn't always mean something bad, but take a look, see the affiliations of the people who have designed the study, because that's, that's just a little caveat of something that's important to do as you educate yourself to, you know, start reading this kind of materials. Well said. You're all cheered up now? <laughs> well, it's, it's nice to be with three passionate people that explain uh, the invisible disorders that we have on the planet today. And as they've each articulated in their own way, uh, it seems like things are innocent until we prove it guilty in our culture. And that's a democratic way to, to think about things except when it comes to corporate greed. And what we've just articulated in the last two minutes is well known today in the science community as checkbook science. Uh, there's very little to no legitimate science going on today. So when we read science, which I do perpetually, I have to cherry pick the purpose of the scientific study. Is it a marketing scheme? Is the end of it uh, the result of selling something? Is it manipulation, as Jeffrey just pointed out? And you have to actually select 
part of the study to see what part of it is valuable or valid at this point. And that's pretty frightening because the average person sitting out there around the world listening to us or here at Times Square in New York uh, actually want to believe that there is reality and science and people looking out for you. But sadly, the powers that be fund the studies. Multi-millions and billions of dollars every year from corporate interest go in to fund the studies. And very little philanthropic science goes on. It's uh, less than uh, one quarter of one percent, where somebody opens a checkbook, says, here you go, do what you want to do. Everything else is, here's what you're going to do, and I'm paying you to do it. And you say, well, is it that corrupt? One of the other things that non-scientists or people who don't understand the scientific community do not understand is science is the study of, not the absolute, not the definitive, so you can play with it. It's like putty, silly putty. And you can twist it and shape it in any form that you want it to. So yes, read science. Yes, be informed because how they get by uh, killing us and allowing this pervasiveness to occur literally is because you're not informed. If there's anyone out there in those 15 countries that's listening to us that wants to help Environmental Health Trust finish our brain modeling study of infants, uh, we just need $20,000 to do it. And I have to tell you a funny story. When I went to the guys in Brazil who do this modeling and I said, can you do this? Because in Brazil, for $20,000, you can do this. In the United States, for $20,000, you can buy half of the secretary in a lab. They said, why would anybody want to know about cell phone radiation getting into the brain of an infant? And I said, just look at the United States, look at our ads. And you saw, some of you saw the ads I showed you today. It's on our Facebook page for Environmental Health Trust right now. You can find that ad showing a potty trainer with an iPad holder on it. And I thought, gee, if they, if they succeed in training a three- to four-year-old on an iPad holding potty, What's going to happen when that kid goes to a public bathroom? Are we going to need to have iPad holders, yeah, exactly. right? I mean, I've seen people in public bathrooms using phones and iPads in ways that are just horrifying. Think about the spread of influenza and E. coli. People have no idea what they're doing when they take those devices into a bathroom, let alone in a public facility. You're right. But it's we are, true. no, no, it's true. But we are ready to complete that study. And there are other things like that that small groups uh, like us can do. And I would urge you who are interested to uh, support us and others who are out there. Thanks. So we've got to make the quarter of 1% be 1%, 2%, 5%, and get legitimacy back in science again. Uh, the Institute had a different view of this whole thing because our founder wasn't a scientist. She was uh, told she was going to die by the most renowned doctors in America at Harvard. And being a woman from Eastern Europe with common sense uh, said, gee, maybe they're wrong. Maybe I don't have to die because I was told I, I should. <clears throat> and backed into this thinking the opposite of innocent until guilty. She thought guilty until innocent. And so we've backed into this entire process and started to ask questions in the 1950s. Why are people coming here with cancer more and more every day? <clears throat> now remember, in the 1960s, cancer was one-third of what it is today. But Anne had such good common sense, she said, my God, you know, here it is, 1960 not 1955, 1956 when I started, and there's more people with cancer. And when I joined the staff in the mid-70s, uh, we didn't have young people with cancer ever that came to Hippocrates. So seldom. I mean, I, I remember the first child I saw with cancer. I literally cried and sobbed driving home every night. I wouldn't do this in front of the guests or my wife or my children. Uh, when I saw that little boy from Montana, that had to flee the state of Montana with his two illiterate cowboy, mother and father. This is a true story. And I said, why don't you come here in your pickup truck? And they said, well, you know, all we know is every child in, in the area we live in get leukemia, and when they go to the hospital, they die, and we just don't want our children to die. So we came here because our aunt came here years ago and reversed cancer. Can you help us? 
And that little boy, two, two and a half years old, looked pregnant. And sadly, I've become unfortunately somewhat callous because when you come to Hippocrates now, 60 years later, the sickest people sitting there with us are the youngest people. And on a weekly basis, I'm with a mother and father in my office. They look at me and say, why us? Why does my eight-year-old have brain cancer? Uh, the United States government, CDC, just reported a year, year and a half ago that the number one killer of our babies below five now is cancer. Not accidents, cancer. The number two killer of our children below 18 is cancer. Accidents are the only thing that supersedes that. And leukemia and brain cancer. So we had to back into this and we started to ask the questions. How did this happen? Well, it happened because of chemicals first, the Industrial Revolution, which was spawned in 1860 in London, England, uh, spread rapidly throughout the world, and they pulled all of us off farms and put us in factories so that a handful of people could become much wealthier. And that has become so bizarre at this point. Every year, 2,000 brand new chemicals are made, as Ms. Grossman will tell you. And they mix with tens of thousands and millions of other chemicals, making billions of other chemistries. And then we got really smart because we said, you know, technology is the future, which it is. And all of us said, so, well, we're not going to back out of this. We have to change it. Uh, we started with radiation next to our brains and microwave radiation. Now, I don't know anyone here that would stick your head or listening out there in the world into a microwave oven, would you? But you're literally doing that at some level, sticking that cell phone to your head. And... Then we got really smart when we allowed corporate interests to control governments and Monsanto, the evil empire, and there's no way I'll back down on that. This people makes Dark Vader look like a Boy Scout. This is the evil empire. They started to say for the control of seeds, the control of seeds, so that we, one corporation, can profit from seeds and control the destiny of human diet. We are going to manipulate seeds, not to make it better or more resistant and all of the silliness that they tell you about. And as was mentioned by Deborah earlier, they literally have been putting for 25 years fish genes into tomatoes. They've literally been putting human genes into pork. And some of you probably ate that pork. And the list goes on and on and on. So we backed into it, but now we figured out, and that's why the real truth about health has had this conference, to bring these truth tellers together. We know why you're getting cancer. We know why people are sick. This year we're going to have an autism program at Hippocrates. You know why? Because it's frightening. Conservative estimates now say one out of 50 children in the United States have some level of autism. The CDC reported in 1980. 33 years ago, it was one out of 10,000. And if Brazil, or not Brazil, South Korea has more than the United States, we should start praying for people in South Korea. So all I can say to you is that there is a remedy, and we've been clinically proving that remedy. But how it works at Hippocrates is the day you get there, we tell you we've never healed one person in 60 years. We cannot heal you. Doctors cannot heal you. You have got to heal yourself by changing your lifestyle. And how you change your lifestyle is not change your diet first. It's change your attitude first. If you don't change your attitude, you will not eat properly and respect yourself. You will not exercise and do all the other prerequisite things that we get focused on. It's not the diet and the exercise first. It's the passion for life, the fulfillment that we have. This is really what our aspiration should be. And of course, people who are happy and wanting to be fulfilled will eat the right fuel and move the body. I have a question, and that is, how do we know that the fact that we're seeing higher 
death rates from cancer today isn't due to the fact that we are more successfully able to prevent other previously fatal diseases from becoming fatal, such as heart disease, which people used to die all the time of the kind of heart attacks that are now no longer fatal, just as an example. We'll both, both answer it, because she, she worked in this field, too. There's always seemingly a skepticism and a trade-off. If you look at, for instance, the work of my colleague, Dr. Campbell, up at Cornell, uh, he went to our government as, by the, the way, the number one purveyor of dietary information two different times here in the United States, and said to the United States government, meat and dairy is killing people. Will you help us do research on that? And went around the world and couldn't find any takers except communist China. And that's why his landmark uh, phenomenal research published in 1990, uh, the academic uh, research called the China Study, did such a brilliant job showing you that it's not because we died earlier from other things, because that's a misnomer too, by the way. That's statistical manipulation. And what you have to understand is that that book was distilled, and many of the people sitting here and listening around the world have seen it, into the China study where I said, even if you don't know how to read, look at the charts. Countries that eat meat and dairy, which, by the way, contain more genetic modification, more chemicals, and retain more radiation. So the more fat you have in your body, the more saturated fat, the more GMO, the more chemicals, and the more radioactivity will maintain in there. That's why people are getting the cancer. So that's why we know it. Now, add your part to it. Okay. Well, as a cancer epidemiologist, um, what we can say is this. Yes, some small part of the increase in cancer is due to the fact that people are living longer. But we also know that the rate of cancer per 100,000 people per certain age groups has changed. So, as Brian just said, the rate of childhood cancer has risen 30% since 1970. Adjusted for the number of children, the probability of getting cancer is higher today for any child in the United States of America than it has ever been. So that for children under five, cancer is now the leading cause of death in young children. It was not before. And it's not that children are getting older faster, okay? <laughs> We can also look at what's called the age-specific rate. So that means what is the rate of cancer for people aged 45 to 54, 55 to 64, and up? When we do that, we adjust for the number of people in that age group. And when we do that, and when we look internationally, which is another project Environmental Health Trust is fine to finish, we see that brain cancer is increasing in young persons. But we have, we have, in order to get those data, Not only increasing, shocking increasing. yes, and in order to get those data on these shocking increases in brain cancer in young people, we can't just press a few buttons on a computer because the cancer registries in these countries don't provide it in that fashion. We have to analyze it and uh, put it into certain constructs and parameters that we can evaluate it. And when we do that, a young colleague of mine who was my postdoc and is now an assistant professor at Pittsburgh and I, published in the journal Cancer, published by the American Cancer Society, that the generation of people born in the 1950s has between 1.2 to two times more cancer than the generation born at the turn of the century, adjusted for all of these other things. It's called a cohort analysis. We look at the birth cohort and we find that if you take away smoking-related cancers in total, which we did, and you take away all the diagnostic cancers that have improved because of PSA testing and mammography screening, which may cause as many breast cancers that it finds, by the way, when you take out all of those cancers, screening detected and smoking-related, we published in 2010 a significant increase in generational risk occurring adjusted for aging of the population. So you can do the analyses. Most people have glazed over by now. It's late, and I'm talking about statistics. But the reality is public health statistics are human beings with the tears removed. Absolutely. 
And we need to do a better job of explaining that to the public so that people will understand there is a real increase in cancer in middle-aged persons that we did not have before. One of the strongest arguments for there to be environmental causes comes from studies of twins. Identical twins come from one egg, splits in two at conception. Monozygotic identical twins. In Scandinavia, they have twin registries. And those registries show that identical twins at age three look pretty close to identical. At age 50, they do not have the same cancer. If they really were, the, it was all genetic, you'd get them to have the same cancer. And in fact, you can look at methylation patterns in the genes in these identical twins, and where they look identical at age three, at age 50, they don't even look like they're related to one another. It's a very powerful argument uh, for why the environment is important. So we say that genes give you the gun, and the environment pulls the trigger. Okay, any of you that have questions, we have about a half an hour now to answer questions. So come on down to the microphones on the left and right side and be very clear. Don't be shy. Uh, we don't have the cameras on any of you. So over here to my right. Okay, uh, first I want to make a comment. Uh, Dr. Davis, I just want to say thank you for looking for a solution. So many times we have seminars like this where we just talk about the problem, the problem, but we don't ask for solutions, and I just want to say thank you for that. Yes, I agree. Uh, my question is, a couple of years ago I heard about uh, nonstick pans and the chemicals that came out of nonstick pans and how they would kill birds that were in the house. So I threw away all my nonstick pans, but recently um, on one of the shopping networks, they had a product that did not have, I believe it was called P-O-H-A or something like that. It was the chemical. And they said it was that free. And so I ordered it. Mm -hmm. But I felt guilty when I had it home because I kept thinking, is this real? It doesn't have that chemical. So I just want to hear your comments on that. All right. The original perfluorinated organic acid compounds, PFOA, uh, contained fluor fluorinated compounds that could when heated, become airborne, and did kill parakeets and other birds. Okay, that did happen. That was real. Um, but as uh, Elizabeth has said, we often go chasing one chemical after another. We ban one, and then we come up with a substitute that could be even worse. And in the case for fluorinated and brominated flame retardants, in 1976 we banned something called TRIS, which was a chlorinated uh, fluorinated flame retardant that used to be put into children's pajamas. And 20 years later, it ended up in mattresses in California because the state of California was persuaded by the chemical industry that you needed to have a standard that required that urethane foam not catch on fire for eight seconds and that this was going to save lives from fire deaths. Well, it's not true. It, there's no evidence it saved any lives. But it is true that the chemical industry has made billions of dollars from selling people, mattress manufacturers, fabric manufacturers, furniture manufacturers, and now requiring that there be some kind of flame retardant in those materials. Recently, the state of California succeeded in reforming that law, but I'm not so sure that the yeah. substitute is much better. This pan is, does have, is free of the chemicals that used to kill birds. Um, but we don't know. Uh, it has not been fully evaluated. Yeah, and, and I ask Elizabeth. And to... I'll just say, I saw those ads. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I kept passing this one kitchen store that said eco-friendly, you know, nonstick pans. And I ended up doing a whole chapter in my book called Out of the Frying Pan because I got so obsessed about trying to find out what was in these alternative pans. And the fact was you can't really find out what is in them. Some of them have a version of that we call it generically Teflon of that original nonstick coating, and it may not have the exact compound, but it has one very close to it, or it's made with some of the same sort of chemical bits and pieces. And the ones that may have something else, we have no idea what it is mostly because you can't actually get that information. So, so it's, it's the devil you know yeah. versus the devil you don't know. <laughs> Hello. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all of you. Um, Brian, I read your book on killer clothes, and I wanted to know where, you may, where we're at at this level of toxic chemicals in clothes. 
Well, I won't name any names, but one of the most famous designers in the world, I approached them after the book was finished that Dr. Anna Marie and I wrote and challenged them to be the co-author of that book because I wanted to impress the fabric and design industry that they are contributing to killing people. Uh, We quote two landmark studies in there just on breast cancer and nylon, polyester, man-made chemical bras where both cited that women who consistently wear these bras have a six-time greater chance of breast cancer. And flame retardants, uh, we talk about it's cancer-causing, even though they eliminated the one that Deborah mentioned. There are several others that cause cancer. Uh, Just before the book was put to bed, my research assistant went to Berkeley to an international conference with concerned scientists, concerned chemists, And uh, he came back and stunned me. You know, whenever I think I know all the bad things, um, surprise, there's more bad things. You know, you turn the rock over. So I would like to tell you an optimistic thing that we're moving more so into natural fibers. I will say one optimistic thing. They're much more available, and they're getting out of the granola, my generation's design, that everyone has to look like a hippie wearing them. And they are designing them. Some of the better designers now have organic clothing. Uh, You've got to watch some of these new clothes have as many chemicals on them, and you'll articulate this as well as I can, uh, made out of wood. Just because it's made out of wood, how do they process it? Just because it's made out of bamboo, how do they process it? And so in killer clothes, we write that very clearly. Organic cotton is the best and easiest to find. Uh, Why? Because... 25% of all the pesticides on planet Earth are used in growing cotton. How many of you knew that? And how about if you put it next to your genitalia every day? How about if you buy, and I won't name any brands, uh, a cotton underwear, but it is filled with pesticide? Well, all of this increases estrogens. Genetic modification increases estrogen, electromagnetic fields, throw off estrogens and other hormones, and chemicals do that. So at least walk out of here if you're not already doing it and buy organic undergarments. If you're not doing that, you're not serious. You're just sitting here as a hobby because that's the first step. And then slowly but surely get natural fiber clothes and try to make as many. Women have an easier time in the workplace than men. Uh, Make as many as possible organic. Over here. My name is John Eagle. Some of you know me as John Eagle. Some of you know me as John Eagle Freedom. Dr. Brian Clements saved my life going on close to two decades ago. I have Indian blood, and that blood runs red. And I've got grandchildren. I want to take a survey right here to inspire maybe some of you, but to eliminate this problem. Because Dr. Brian Clement has stepped up, and I have been encouraging him for over a decade to be the spokesperson for the real truth about health. Stephen, wherever you're at, you've done a great job um, bringing us together. <laughs> Thank you. This auditorium has seats for 700. We should be ashamed of ourselves because we have less than 300. I have a platform that I'd like to introduce tonight, and I'd like to take a survey. How many of you go to church? How many of you have ministers? Leave your hands up. How many ministers pray over sick and dying? Everybody. Now, how would you like to have this audience, 17,000, 19,000, instead of 300? I want to know how many of you would come to an event that that I would like to speak into existence at Madison Square Garden. And we contacted churches, every denomination around the world, to be streamed live into that event. Everyone knows a minister. Everyone's lost either body parts or family members to these symptoms of disease that are created by greed by the corporate America. So... If we would just use geometric math, which is the eighth wonder world, we can stop this insanity that is putting our children behind bars, not behind prison bars, but in prison behind our own minds and bodies with autism, diabetes, cancer, 
I'm a survivor cancer patient. It's cancer's easy to eliminate. It's a deficiency disease. How many of you, and I'd like to see a show of hands, wants to stop this insanity? How many of you would ask your ministers to come to Madison Square Garden for free? Show of hands. What's wrong with the rest of you? you they don't have ministers. <laughs> Ask rabbis, ministers, priests. You have to broaden Every, this. Everybody. I'm not non-denominational, across the board. Okay. Now, that being said, what's the number one thing on the Internet? It's not pornography. It's free. Now, second thing on the Internet is pornography. Now, you put free sex together, you better go play in the freeway because that's insanity. Okay. I want to say this. We pull together and be, get behind a spokesperson, Dr. Brian Clement. He's the most eloquent speaker I've ever met, and I owe him my life. And maybe many of you owe him your life, too. But what about the lives of our grandchildren? It's about time that we do something instead of just come in here in an empty theater and listen to the statistics that nobody wants to know because you can go out there on Madison Square Garden or New York and ask people, uh, you know about Hippocrates? Oh, yeah, he's that famous basketball player. <laughs> people don't know. Uh, uh, now, thank, thank you, John. We'll let the others ask. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> We're over, over this side now. Hey, uh, thanks for your wisdom. Really appreciate it. Hey, I, I speak on the environment, and I kind of run into when you start talking to the other crowd who's not really into the movement, uh, you really find a lot of resistance. And the other side kind of frames us into a corner, like I'm kind of framed like, you know, the Ayatollah of Granola, you know, <laughs> just these kind of, uh, you know, kind of these radical people. And well, everyone I talk to, all my friends, and they all say the problem is the message is there's so much doom and gloom. And listening to all the facts tonight, I mean, it's very enlightening, but... Again, how do we better frame the message to get out there because it turns off so many people. It's like, oh, my gosh, all you're talking about is doom and gloom. So how do we get that out to people? I'll take that one. Let's start anyway. With GMOs, we have the advantage that people can make decisions regarding their diet directly, and it does not require policy change. Europe kicked GMOs out, not because it was the European Commission, but it was Nestle's and Unilever and McDonald's and Burger King and Walmart because consumers didn't want to have them because the media actually covered the issue. <clears throat> to create a tipping point of consumer rejection in the United States, it only takes a small percentage of the population to avoid eating GMOs, which will drive down the market share. And if soon as there's a drop in market share, that the food companies can attribute to the anti-GMO sentiment growing in the United States, that becomes a food industry sell signal, and they get rid of GMOs in the U.S. like they have already gotten rid of GMOs in Europe. So the, in this particular scenario, we actually don't have to wake up the couch potato junk food eating American who hasn't yet figured out that food relates to health and bring him on the long arc to avoid GMOs. He'll never know that... He's eating GMOs. He'll never know we got rid of it for him. So <clears throat> our Institute for Responsible Technology has been engineering a tipping point of consumer rejection by targeting the most receptive demographic groups, health-conscious shoppers, moms, healthcare professionals, sick people, religious organizations, and now pet owners and horse owners. And I am happy to announce, and here's the good news I've been waiting for, we have, within the natural food industry, created the tipping point of consumer rejection in the United States. And that is done. We have done that. And Cheerios this week announced it's non-GMO. Cheerios. Target is taking GMOs out of its home brands this year. Ben & Jerry's did it last year. Chipotle's is doing it. We anticipate a tipping point of consumer rejection in the conventional food market within the next 12 to 18 months. In fact, we have a plan, and I'm going to do an a advertisement. It's going to cost not 20000 but maybe 3 to $5 million per year for about three or five years to end the genetic engineering of the food supply in the world because of this leveraged capacity for people to take it out. It's really, and we're, 
We're raising money for that right now, but we are well underway. It's very good news. Uh, right now, the Hartman Group said in, in uh, 2007, 16% said they were avoiding GMOs. In, two, in 2010, 25% said they were avoiding GMOs. Last year, 39% said they were avoiding GMOs. And those numbers are more than we really need. So we, I, first of all, I encourage people to go to non-gmoshoppingguide.com or download the, uh, uh, the iPhone app Shop No GMO so that you can learn how to avoid GMOs. But really, we are winning this issue when we've backed the biotech industry into the corner. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, one last question over here to the right side of the auditorium. We're going to wind down. Uh, for, it's about 9 o'clock. Okay, great. So... Eight. About 8 o'clock, excuse me. Okay. One quick comment that's kind of interesting there are with the, with the cell phone issue and trying to get around that, there is a cool company. I don't have anything to do with them, but there's a cool company who makes a, a, a partially wired headset, but that runs on air. Remember? Uh, yeah. and, and that's really cool because otherwise a wired headset can still connect the that to your head. Yeah, no, I talked about that. But even so, any okay. headset's better than none. That's the better there, one. There, there you go. Yeah, you're, there you you're go. absolutely right. And I think that the tipping point comes in different ways. You have a market solution because you, you have a market for, for food. I think that when it comes to other social policies, if you think about seat belts and airbags and safety, uh, car seats for children and even, even seats in airplanes for, for children, um, unfortunately, those kinds of things often come about from tragedy and stories. And one of the reasons I write the books that I do is to tell the stories, to give the human face to all of this. Yesterday, in San Francisco, chairman of the FCC, Thomas Wheeler, the former head of the Cell Phone Industry Association, now directing the FCC, was confronted personally by six people, each of whom has had their lives personally affected by losing a family member or themselves having brain cancer from cell phone radiation. It made the newspapers, it may make it around the world, but it's the kind of confrontation of reality. That's what the human face of this looks like. And when people start to see that, when they start to see the children with cancer, the children with autism and other things, and start to make that association on the human level, then I think we will make progress on, on that front as you are making in the market. Thanks. Thank you for all the questions and the interest. It's wonderful. Thanks, my colleagues. They were all articulate. Let's give them all a giant hand. <laughs>